Are you doing any exposure in the crypto space? Like, do you have anything for Bitcoin that you're doing? Yeah, we do. Um, look, the way I look at Bitcoin is is quite different to the way I look at, at almost every other sector that we're that we're invested in, because it's not something we can look at and go, okay, that represents deep value. It's not a deep value play. It's more of a technology play. But when I look at the geopolitical framework of what we have, um, I think it has extraordinary potential um, in that it is a, it's an asset class which we don't require or it's an asset class which doesn't have a counterparty. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Every other asset class, we have to worry about the counterparty. Um, with Bitcoin, you don't. It's and so people call it digital gold, and I think that kind of it does make some sense. Um, gold you own because it's a you don't have the counterparty risk. You can buy it, you buy your Krugerrands or whatever, put it in the drawer. It's yours. But if you ever want to transport it, it's very difficult to transport. Um, try getting on a plane with uh, half a million dollars of gold coins. I'm gonna I'm gonna fly, mm -hmm. and. So so that's difficulty in that respect, whereas Bitcoin doesn't, it offers you an alternative in that. Right? And all we need to do is look at any of these countries which have had um, capital controls placed, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, et cetera. And the stories that come out of it, where literally the, the, the best asset to own, and not because it was going to go up in value, was Bitcoin, but because the utility value of it in a, in a world that we live in today was just extraordinary. And so I think in this environment, it's, I think it's a must own. It's really just depends on your own risk profile and how much, how you risk weight that particular allocation. Um, so it's, it's a unique, and, and I do think that we're going to have the digital currencies are, are gonna come um, out of this, this mess. In, in terms of um, on a global space. Whether Bitcoin is included in that or not, I don't know. I do think there's a, there's a I do think there's a, a non-zero risk that governments ban it. And that's, I think the biggest risk to it. Um, and, and that's why you would want to like risk weight it accordingly. I wouldn't be going and putting 50% of my capital or anything like that into it um but it it offers ex extraordinary utility value and and it's a deflationary asset class um in in this kind of environment i could easily see it going hundred thousand in the next two years yeah. i mean people look at that and they go oh that's crazy well it's way way easier for it to do that than than what it did which was it went from a few cents to 20,000, right? Um, that big move is, we're not gonna get anything like that again. Um, that was was extraordinary. So um, yeah, so that's my views on, on Bitcoin. So you mentioned uh, the energy, which is obviously tied to the food supply, agriculture, uh, localized energy. Uh, we're going back into more or less localism as opposed to globalism um besides the energy and bitcoin is there any other uh categories or industries that you're focusing on currently yeah i mean look we've got half a dozen um that we have built a a portfolio around um and the idea is that you want to have deep value plays a number of them that have the potential first that, that firstly shouldn't or wouldn't go away so your risk side is 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 has a certain flaw to it now when i say that it doesn't mean that you couldn't buy something and it doesn't drop by 20 30 percent mm -hmm. uh, but but over time it, it can't go away right? mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. fundamental to to civilization and to the functioning of of our world um and, and you build a basket of these different things where, where you've got your risk taken care of and then your upside is, is relatively, uh, sometimes it's, it's quite good and sometimes it's really, really good. 
most of what we have is is fits into that bucket. There are a few plays that are shorter term in nature. The tank, as we talk about, the US dollar, we're very bullish on the dollar um, for the shortish term. But that's more of a structural issue with respect to what's going on in the world. Um, and the fact that we're in a credit contraction um, and in a credit contraction, when you have the world's reserve currency as the dollar, which it is, um, there's a, a, a need for dollars. And we'll have to see how that plays out. That's, Fed's been opening swap lines and doing all sorts of um, gymnastics in order to alleviate that stress. Um, indications are that some of that's working. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we'll, we don't, we just, you, at this point in time, we don't want to be short the dollar, that's for sure. So we're actually got quite a long exposure on the dollar. Um, and part of that also ties into what's happening in Europe and the, and because the dollar index is roughly half of it is the, is, is the euro. And so people forget, they'll look at what's going on in the US and go, oh, well, they're doing this and they're doing that and the dollar's going to die and all and that. And I look at them like, yeah, so why are you so bearish to euro? And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the reality of it. So so there's you need to look at things in context. Um, and and so the Europe, Europe in general is in an enormous pickle. We're literally seeing the breakup of, of the EU right now. Um, consider that, I mean, Brexit was all about taking back sovereignty of borders. Guess what's just happened? The mm -hmm. virus came along. The EU didn't step in and say, oh, we're closing the border between Italy and, uh, and Spain and between Switzerland. And No, 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 no. Each of those countries individually said, we're closing our borders. And that and that just exposes the flaw in logic that that was the European Union. The European Union is a joke, man. It's a cartel. It's like follow our economic policies. So my whole family's in Europe. And um, it's funny. I had my honeymoon there two years ago. I went everywhere. And just for shits and giggles, I like to talk to local entrepreneurs, small business owners, and talking about their story. So we went to, yeah, it was all EU countries. Yeah, And uh, I haven't met one small business owner in any EU country that likes the European Union. Not one. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The, ec the economic no, cartel of Brussels these, is just insane. These, these are countries and um, tribes, if you will, that have spent thousands of years fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. Thousands. Of Look, the the... Um, open trade, I think, was a good idea. Mm -hmm. The European currency was a terrible idea. Terrible, yeah. Because it, it, it inflicted on those trading nations. Um, uh, well, it pulled their... It, it, it destroyed their own sovereignty. Destroyed their own sovereignty. And it made them all um, slaves of, of Brussels. Um, and if you can't control your own monetary policy, then you can't control your own politics. You can't control anything. And that's essentially what the EU wanted, um, or the, the pointy shoes in Brussels wanted. But it's destroyed um, the economies. I mean, look, these guys have been going at it for over a decade where it's been really, really troublesome. Economic growth has been lackluster. Um, it's It's... It's reached a situation where the unemployment rates in these countries are mirroring those in sub-Saharan Africa, and um, and it's all being kept afloat by a um, by debt, more and more debt that has been issued by the ECB, which has been their their, their tool to keep um, to keep the European nations. Um, tied into the system. Um, it's a little bit like feeding a dog and then whipping him, you know, and he'll keep coming back to you because he's starving. Mm. But he, he, you know, you give him another option and he's going to be out of there or he's going to turn around and he's going to fucking bite your head off at some point. Um, and that's really what it looks like. So this, you know, the, the if there's if there is something good to come out of the um the virus issue it is that it will almost certainly break that um 
terribly despotic type of structure. One hopes that it, that what we get out of it on the other side is much um, much more freedom loving, but we don't know that. So um, there there are risks there. I think it's going to break apart. Like I, I st- if you look at the especially with the tide, what the e, what the euro did to the lira, man, they decimated the economy of Italy, decimated it. Well, it's it's across it's Greece, it's Italy, um, yeah, it's Portugal, it's Spain, yeah, yeah. No, look, it's um, it's, and the beneficiary behind it has largely been been Germany. And look, I mean, the only way they can actually do this is to create, um, is to um, is to pool their debts. You can't have pooled currency without pooled um, debt, mm. and, and that's what they tried to do. And it's created these enormous tensions and these disparities across the eurozone. And so you can't, you know, that's that's now showing the flaw. So, um, but the problem is that if you're going to federalize that debt, if you will, across a federal Europe. Um, the loser is going to be Germany. Yeah. And I don't see them taking that hit. If they do, um, I suspect that we will have, um, we will have a new power in Germany that gets elected. And then that new power will go and change that structure. Um, but so, then, then there's so, the outlier of the UK though. It's interesting what they want to, what kind of power play they want to play in Europe then too. Well, the UK did the right thing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you see a sinking ship, you get off. Um, many people disagree with that, but that's the reality. Again, um, they gave up access to markets and so on and so forth. Um, but you were, you, were, you were tied into a sinking ship. Um, and and so they did the right thing. Um, on a relative basis, they... They're in a better position. They will be in a better position um, than any of the other European um, countries. And what you're likely to see is on an individual basis, it'll start fragmenting. And some of these countries will say, you know what, we're just going to go and do a deal with, with Britain. Yeah. The hell with these. And so we want your your beef or whatever it is, and we'll sell you our bananas and, you know, and they'll do some sort of trade deals, which will be um, in contravention of the EU rules. But look, they're already, con- they are already breaking those rules right now by them setting up borders and locking down their borders. They broke them and nobody, they didn't even stop to think whether that was going to be um, uh okay with brussels or anything like that they just went no nah, we are mm-hmm. we're close to our borders we're doing this now and they went in their head and they did it and and at the end of the day unless you have unless you have the ability both the ability and the determination to stop um, someone doing something then it doesn't matter what laws you put in place and so the european union is it doesn't there is no common army so how, how are you going to stop Austria shutting their borders? Mm-hmm. You can go and wag your finger at them and you can punish them, excuse me, with sanctions or you could penalize them in the banking system and withdraw liquidity. You could do a whole lot of things, but at the end of the day, if they decide we're doing this, they're doing that, you can't, it's it's more difficult than in, a, um, than in say, the United States or in Canada to actually um, that and so we're already seeing that taking place so i anticipate that we'll see more of that um because that it's like the system's cracked and say cracks open you can just keep pulling it open and we're going to see more and more of that so so britain on a relative basis is going to be better off than um than many of the european countries yeah i think we'll leave it at that man we covered a lot chris i just want to thank you so much for coming on again and uh, sharing your insights i know before we got on this call you wanted to share uh, a special uh package uh with my audience and can you go ahead and kind of share exactly uh, i know because you have like an insider newsletter that you guys offer to uh people who are more interested yeah so the the newsletter that we have is essentially the research work that we do for our institutional and high net worth clients um, and and managed capital. And so we take a lot of that research and we publish it 
to family offices and hedge funds and all the way down to retail. Joey, who who's trying to navigate these markets, um, and so that's called we call that insider, and um, and it includes a lot of reports that we put out, special um, reports. It's, it's look, it's, I think it's fair to say, um, and this is almost like a warning. It's not. It's not like a typical newsletter, you know, people shouldn't sign up and think, oh, we're going to get um, a monthly newsletter at the end of the month. We're going to get told what stock to buy or sell. <laughs> That's not what it is, um, because I don't know any professional money manager who manages their money like that. It's absurd. I know that the publishing industry works like that and people get excited about some stock and whatever. Like what we do is we manage a portfolio with a, with a number of different ideas. We, we show people how to build a portfolio, how to position size for risk and how to asset allocate. Um, and then we manage that portfolio and we give constant updates around the particular equities and sectors and everything else as to when to get in, when to get out, when to reposition and so on and so forth. Um, and that's it's how we manage our capital. That's how we manage clients' capital. And so we, it's really just an extrapolation of that. Um, and so that's a, we, we have um, a weekly publication we put out, which is just updating on the various things that are going on. Then there's special reports. There's a massive archive of material. I run a week, a monthly um, Q and A where clients can uh, ask me their questions and we cover all of those questions in a webinar. And then we've got a community of, um, of these investors that all converse with each other um, in in a Slack channel. Um, that's kind of the crux of of what that service is. Um, so, it's um, yeah, that's that's what it is. Um, we've just recently, you know, we've had a lot of we've had an extraordinary amount of interest in what um, in what we're doing, and a lot of it from institutions and then retail as well. Um, basically, the things that we've been talking about for two three years. Um, people are looking at it now going, whoa, okay, you guys were spot on with a lot of this and, and we're quite interested in, in knowing more. Um, and so we recently opened, opened up membership again and, um, and we're running a discount on that. So um, uh, I think Lucas sent you through some details on that too. Yeah, so if anybody's interested, uh, Chris has offered a special discount for anybody listening and watching this. So if you're watching this, there's a link in the description box. Also, if you're on YouTube, it's in on the pinned comment. If you're listening to this, you just head over then to uh, YouTube uh, and just look at the latest video, which is this. I will also be sending this on my email. So if you're on my email newsletter, if you're not, just go to amirosic.com. But I highly recommend it. Like you. I've had Chris on twice, guys. Like he knows this stuff. He's not even just he's the thing what I like about Chris is he he's not coming in from just from an investor mindset. He's coming in from an entrepreneur mindset as well. He's built businesses. He understands what it takes to build businesses. And he looks at the whole picture as opposed to the micro. He looks at looks at the macro, looks at the geopolitics, looks at the global perspective as opposed to just looking at one piece of data. You got to put all the piece of data together. So I would definitely recommend everybody go check it out. Just take a look. And, uh, you know, especially in these days, you need a, you need a, a, a greater a greater scope of, of information as opposed to a very small sliver of information that you find on Twitter. Thanks, Amir. You make me sound in, make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, always a pleasure, brother. Talk to you again. Awesome. Take care, mate.